All right, I cut out, uh, now here's, I was reading an article and I thought, how does this relate to social entrepreneurship? Is there some way I can connect it? And it's, um, it was a review of a Texas restaurant, Tillman's Roadhouse, and they had a picture and they had uh, uh, trophy mountings, what do you call them? Um, heads, taxidermy heads on the walls. And you know, there's a lot of people that are more concerned with the animals and they don't hunt and so they're, you know, they think a social need in the world is to preserve animals and, and to do things in animals' behalf, you know, PETA, et cetera. And you know, there's some good issues in that regard. These guys, instead of having real animal heads, they have laser cut taxidermy heads from oak. That's awesome. So they are wood heads. So instead of having a real animal that's been shot, they have the ambiance of you know, nature, but it's totally laser carved out of wood. And I thought, you know, that, that might be a social entrepreneur business where you are saving animals from being killed, but yet making a profit in a unique way. Then you've got the tree huggers to worry about. And tree, JJ? Trees provide jobs for families and food on the table. Mm -hmm. um, yes. They, this just reminds me of that talking fish. They used to see that one sing on the wall. <laughs> What, the, the bass, what was it? What's, it? what's the name of it? Uh, did I miss anything on campus? Uh, anything happened over the last couple days that uh, I need to know about? No. You high fiving? Or? What? Yeah. Uh, Allie's date uh, sent me the. Uh, the feedback from her telling him about social entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Natalie's on the way. Natalie's on the way. What if he, what if he doesn't come through for you? Then I'm screwed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here was another interesting cutout. Again, this was from uh, a travel magazine. And the headline is Great Meal Square Deal. Uh, the request check please is now passe in several eateries in the West that have chosen to abandon menus with set prices in favor of seasonal dishes and suggested donations. Okay, diners themselves decide at Salt Lake City's One World Cafe, a model for restaurants in several cities. Uh, after selecting from a buffet of largely local and organic delectables, patrons reach into their pockets and pay what they can. The beauty is that everybody can afford a healthy meal. Those that can't pay are encouraged to help out by sweeping, bussing dishes, or weeding the cafe's garden. We're a hand up, not a hand out, she says. Offshoots have sprouted in other western states, including Spokane, Washington, and four uh, in Denver. Proprietors nationwide have begun turning to her for professional advice. Uh, a, a quixotic pursuit, what, what does that adjective mean, quixotic? What? Okay, what's it based on? Don Quixote. Don Quixote, it's spelled Q-U-I-X-O-T-I-C. So you got quix and exotic part together. So it comes from Don Quixote, uh, a novel by, who's our English majors here, anyone? Cervantes, okay, and who is the, uh, the, the character? Is his name Don Quixote? Yeah. Okay, I thought, didn't he have another name? He's the man of the launcher. Okay, yeah, maybe I'm okay, I was twisting that around. I thought he had a, mo a more common name. Anyway, so he went tilting at windmills, so he is in in mythology, in, in literature, symbol, symbolic of someone who goes on, as you first said, what was your definition of quixotic again, Max? Feudal foolishness. 
futile foolishness. Some people might see it as futile foolishness. Other people might see it as futile endeavors or something that's positive. You know, you have to, you, it's, it's very subjective whether what we're doing is worth it. I mean, think about the, how many missionaries do we have out right now? Well, me? I think it's closer to 50, didn't someone say 53? It's bit, it, was, it was up higher before they lower, raised the bar. All right, well, let, let's round it to 50. Okay? Those young men and young women could be earning how much a year if they were salaried employees? Okay, well, could we, is, is 30,000 maybe a good average? Some will make more and some will make less? Okay. All right, so we got zero, 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 zero. Zero, 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 15. So what's that combined salary that they could be earning? 1.5 billion is what they're giving in volunteer labor to the church. So couldn't someone come along and say, why don't you do something more worthwhile? You got a 50,000 volunteers out there why don't you have them build bridges and villages and you know, do more good in the world? You know, so someone could look at our missionary endeavors and say, we're Don Quixotes. We're futile, what was it again, Max? Futile, in, futile foolishness. Okay, I think, unfortunately, there are a lot of people that think our missionaries are futile foolishness, right? Unfortunately, as they slam the door in their faces. But that's, that's quite, uh, a donation the church makes to the missionary effort in that regard. All right, uh, let's see, what did that come across? Oh, so what do you think about a restaurant where you don't have a set price? Max? Well, I remember a few months ago I was reading about one of the first businesses that started doing that was a bagel shop, a sandwich shop in the south somewhere. And a lot of people said they were going to go out of business and they were struggling before they put up this pay what you can plan. And they said they do get people who come and they'll take a bagel for free or give them a couple of pennies. But they said, oddly enough, they're making more money now. The only downside they've had is that everybody else is mad at all the other bagel shops are mad at them because they're putting everybody else out of business. Hmm. But they've been actually a huge success at it. They said the owner kind of figured, well, I might as well go out with kind of, you know, go out with kindness because he thought they were going to go under. And then when they, because they, they were already going downhill, but when they offered that, they actually, they're making more money than ever. Hmm. Any other thoughts on that, Charles? Uh, the One World Cafe in Salt Lake has been around for a little while now, too. Have you been there? I've never been there, but I have friends that have been there. They said it's really good, too. Where, where is it? Uh, it's downtown Salt Lake. Okay. I don't know exactly where. I think it's by the University of Utah. Okay. Did they pay that the same way? Huh? Is it the same way? Yeah, th th this is an article about them, the Salt Lake one. Everyone that I know that's been there said it's really good and it's like awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So, uh, you know, we had uh, the trophy head idea, the pay as you go for restaurants, you know. I hope that when you end this class, you never look at things the same. I hope we have sensitized you so you're always looking at the world through a lens of SE. And you say, all right, how could I use that to better the world? What's the, the elevator speech definition of SE? Social entrepreneurship is? A little louder? Using business skills to solve social problems. Using business skills to solve social problems. Okay, so those are two examples of people that have combined business and social things in their business endeavors. What's the, uh, what's the church's social goals? Does anyone know the fourfold emphasis of the church's social make the world better endeavors besides missionary work and temple work? You know, those are couple things. Here's a newsletter from Church Humanitarian Services. 
I'm going to open it up and t show you the four things. But you've never heard of them before? Fourfold social <coughs> endeavors, the fourfold humanitarian endeavors of the church. Feed the hungry. What did you say? Feed the hungry. Would that be one? No. Clothe the naked. No. Administer the sick and afflicted. No, those are all general <laughs> things. Those are all good things, but the church has picked four things to put the emphasis on. Education. No, not even education. That's a, another thing. Leilani? What? No. No. So they have, they've done some things with measles, but that was not, you know, they do other things, but these are the four big ones that they have, they actually have, you know, managers and directors of these four areas at church headquarters. What? Well, I'm surprised that no one knows them. No. No. It's interesting. They have not. What? Okay. Wheelchairs is one of them. What? The church provides and, and makes arrangements for companies to donate wheelchairs around the world. Did anyone ever have that in any of their missions? Was that in your mission? Uh huh. And because the church can't really directly go to China and do proselytes, and they do a lot of charity work for example, the wheelchairs, and also other uh, to help the countryside and to build up the facility with water off the church. Okay. Oh, she got she got number two, fresh water, clean water. Okay, we got wheelchairs and fresh water. No. Oh, are you, did you check on the internet? No, I had written down a quote that I was looking at on my phone from Joseph F. Smith, and it said it was, um, it says, our idea of charity, um, therefore, is to relieve present wants and then to put the poor in a way to help themselves so that in turn they may help others. So maybe part of it is help them so that they can help others. Okay, I mean, I'll, yeah. You give someone a wheelchair and you allow them to be more mobile and then they can you know, get off a straight welfare donation. They can go out and do something. As I was coming north through Haula, there was a fellow in a wheelchair waiting at the bus stop. Looks like he's going to work now and you know, if he didn't have a wheelchair, he wouldn't have gotten to the bus stop very easily. Um, and the same with fresh water. If you give fresh water more easily to villages, you can spend less time going back and forth carrying water. I mean, think of how many people, what percentage of their time during the day is spent just bringing water to where they live. I mean, so I, I assume some villages, one to two hours a day is just providing their water for their, their needs for the day. And if they could have that more accessible, they could then spend one to two hours a day doing more productive things. You know, I, I love how it, the sort of you have the domino effect. You know, if you can have some improvement in someone's life in this area, you know, it falls the dominoes in other things in their life. And it, you can create, you know, some amazing improvements just by changing one little thing. Max. I'm just curious about the guy by the doors. I'm sorry? the guy by the doors. I, I don't know where enough. It was, you know, central, you know, by, across from the, one of the main beach parks there. Do you know him? Well, there's just, I would know, there's just something, I'm connecting something to something I've seen every day of the day. Uh -huh. All right, we got two. We got good, clean, here. Good, clean water and wheelchairs. Oh, and so what are the two on the bottom? Education. Books. Uh -huh. Okay, that's on the back. Emergency response. Okay, so they try to do that whenever that happens. All right, I heard the answer over here. Who said it? Books. No. Babies. Neo. Neonatal. Like when the babies are born. Yeah, neonatal resuscitation. 
Okay. Right there. Nothing is easier than breathing. Six and a half billion people on this planet are doing it at this very moment. And yet a million newborn infants die or suffer permanent damage from breathing difficulties each year. Neonatal resuscitation training teaches birth attendants, including physicians, nurses, nurses, midwives, and others worldwide, that enable them to save the lives of newborn. In 2004, medical training teams will go to 26 different countries to teach these life-saving skills. Those who are trained will go on to teach others in their communities of the benefit and great multiply. That's in 2004, yeah? I know, that's right. I thought this was newer. Yeah, so is it still the same four? Yeah, still the same four. I'm just, I, this is the ongoing. I remember the last one, I think it was vision training. Oh, really? You, hey. you have x-ray vision. <laughs> okay. Uh, many of the, how many, how many blind people are there in the world, would you guess? Wow. <laughs> I mean. Too many billion. Well, I mean, what's a lot? I mean, just uh, think of percentages. What, what, what percentage of people are blind? <laughs> hey, I oh. think half the girls I meet are blind because... You know, they go out with you? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. How, how many people? How many people are there in the world? Six point five billion. Okay. So what's one percent of six point five billion? Six hundred and fifty million. Oh, six hundred and fifty million. 65 million is 1%. You know what I mean? All right, so just do quickly the math in your head then. What percentage of the world are LDS? What? 12 percent, percent. Yeah, Thir there's what, 13, almost 14 million? Okay. So we are just 0.2%. So give me a ratio of what are the uh, what's the ratio of members to non-members in the world then? Yeah. How many to one? Be one to <laughs> What woman would want this brain? <laughs> Is no one a math major? Who wants to do that? Well, here's how you do it. Remember we talked about a good business person has to do some rough calculations in their brain. You know, when you're negotiating with someone, you have to be able to come up roughly with some calculations. So if this is one-fifth of a percent, you think, wow, there's five to one in every one percent, so you just multiply that times a hundred, so it's five hundred to one. Okay, you see how I did that? You know, we're we're one. This is one over five is point two, right? And so there's five in every percent, so it's five hundred to one. Uh, you, now just. Uh, <laughs> what? Non non members, six point five billion to fourteen million. Yeah. Just, I mean, this this blows me away. Even at these levels, I mean, think about that. You have a crowd of five hundred people and only one of them is gonna be a member of the church. And if I'm correct, I think all of you are members of the church in the class. Doesn't that just make you wanna almost cry that you're so blessed? I mean, one out of 500. 
I mean, those are horrible odds. You know, I wouldn't take, a, I, I wouldn't take those odds in any kind of bet. Yeah, oh yeah, you have a one in 500 chance of winning. I wouldn't play. Ryan. I mean, it's even lower because the um, most that represents a third, that's probably children. So that 500 to one ratio includes children that probably aren't at the ability to even share the gospel or something. Well, and, and let's assume an activity rate. So active Mormons, a thousand to one. No. So do you, do you sort of see how Jesus talked about us being the salt of the, earl, the, the, of the world and you know, we're a bit of the yeast or the leaven that can affect the world? I mean, we have a big job ahead of us. You know, we are in a small minority, but we have the Lord on our team. We know how this is all going to turn out. You know, I watched, uh, I was at home when they had the, uh, the big football game in Utah on Saturday. Uh, number five was, Utah was being, uh, playing number three TCU in Salt Lake City. So a, a top five matchup of two top five teams. And, you know, <laughs> TCU blew them away. And, you know, everyone was upset, et cetera. On the other hand, think about it. We already know what the score of this earth life is going to be when the game is all over. Do I see a hand? Well, it's, it's back to uh, According to the World Health Organization, there are currently about 45 million people in the world that are blind. Okay. So that's less than 1% are blind. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the figure the church uses here. Many of the 45 million blind people in the world could have their sight restored if they only had access to simple surgical treatments. In many countries in the developing world, medical personnel lack the training and basic surgical equipment to perform the needed surgery. Okay, So the church is focusing on these four areas instead of trying to say, oh, we'll do anything that we run across. They're trying to really be experts in these four areas and make some impact here rather than just doing a little here, a little there of anything that they happen to do. Yes? I just watched a documentary on North Korea and it was a doctor from Nepal with the, they have the blood of the people on Korea so in cataracts. And he said it was a super simple procedure and it showed it, it was pretty intense where it's a cloud of like this white clear stuff that just covers the the eye, and so they just surgically take it out, like almost like a contact lens. It's pretty cool, and they place like a, a contact lens back inside the eye, and then they're, they're and they people have been blind for some of them thirty plus years, and then uh, the, after a day of recuperation and healing, they were they could see one hundred percent. But it was trippy, and they gave all the praise to the uh, the leader of North Korea. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Yeah. They, did, they did like a thousand people in ten days or something crazy like that. It was pretty cool. Yeah. They, uh, I went to a, a, a church service on Sunday. My friend is uh, the branch president at uh, an assisted living place. Uh, and he said there's been a miracle in the last year there. One of the ladies, for the first two years he was there, she never came out of room. She, was, she couldn't see and she didn't leave her apartment. And uh, I, I want him to write me with the details because he told me about this a few months ago and I, I met the lady on Sunday. But somehow she had an interaction with President Monson and got a blessing from him and can see. And so it's amazing to him how her getting her eyesight back has helped her now become a fully functioning member of the, of the branch and the assisted living place. She comes to everything now. You know, she has just totally changed her life getting her sight back. All right, so what are the four areas? Wheelchairs, Okay. 
Here's one that says, how many people need wheelchairs around the world? They estimate 100 mil million need wheelchairs, but lack the means to buy one. Well, so maybe more people need them. It says, around the world is estimated that more than 100 million people need wheelchairs, but lack the means to purchase one. So maybe more people actually need one and they get them, but 100 million need them and don't have them. Uh, the World Health Organization estimates that more than a billion people lack good, clean drinking water. To each year, 2.2 million people die from diseases related to unclean water sources. Okay. The Clean Water Initiative of the Church provides access to clean water with wells and other systems where no such service is available. Providing this simple necessity brings multiple benefits to those who have never known the delight of pure, clean water before. Okay. Does that spark any of your imaginations to, uh, to want to do anything in any of those areas? Mm -hmm. Let me read you this story from uh, the life of Joseph Smith. A group of men were talking with the prophet Joseph Smith one day when news arrived that the house of a poor brother who lived some distance from town was burned down. So it'd be like, you know, someone comes in and says, oh yeah, Anthony's house just burned down. He's so hot, the house burned down. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> I can't control it. All right, so back to Joseph Smith. Everybody expressed sorrow for what had happened. Oh, you know, you know you're not happy when someone has misfortune in their life. The prophet listened for a moment then put his hand in his pocket, took out $5, and said, I feel sorry for this brother to the amount of $5. How much do you all feel sorry? Is $5 a lot back then? A real lot. That was probably equivalent to at least $100, I'm thinking. Okay. So... Don't you like that? The, the prophet said, all right, who's going to put their money where their mouth is? Who's going to actually step the plate and get something done to help this brother instead of just saying, oh, poor you. Okay. So I hope when you leave this class, you will be more ready to do action in social endeavors and not just say, yeah, that's a good thing. That's a good cause. I hope you will... Remember the Joseph Smith story and say, all right, I'm willing to put some of my time and money into this endeavor instead of just saying, oh, that's a good cause. Um, I ran a, I, Ryan had told us about the book by uh, Elder Morrison, a former uh, general authority. And I don't know if he has more than one book out. Do you know, Ryan? This one I'm reading about, it says, Valley of Sorrow, A Layman's Guide to Understanding Mental Illness for Latter-day Saints. Is that the one that you're familiar with? Um, I'm not sure, but he's, he's also given several talks to um, educational settings. Okay. All right, so this one is called Valley of Sorrow. Okay. It's obviously intended for an LDS audience. This is a review of the book. And the lady, uh, Ann Cannon, a Deseret News reporter, she said, here's some things she got from it. Um, in addition to discussing what seem to be the most commonly encountered forms of mental illness, anxiety and eating disorders, depression, schizophrenia, Elder Morrison looks at the myths and misconceptions still surrounding these conditions, conditions particularly in the LDS culture. So the first myth, number one, Mental illness is caused by sin. Don't laugh. One of my son's religion professors actually made the claim he was certain that a lot of what currently passes for depression is a result of transgressions that have not been cleared up. So generally, obviously, a myth. Number two, someone is to blame for mental illness. Here's the worst part. A lot of patients blame themselves for their illness, apparently unaware 
that mom and dad are already busy blaming themselves. You know, you can see how the parents think it's their fault, and you know, the person afflicted by it thinks it's their fault too. Uh, remember, these are myths. So a myth is someone is to blame for it. Number three, all that the people with mental illness need is a priest of blessing. It goes without saying that Elder Morrison, an emeritus general authority of the church, believes in the power of priests of blessings. But he makes it very clear that individuals suffering from mental illness should be lovingly encouraged to seek qualified medical attention as well. Number four, myth. Mentally ill people just lack willpower. If only picking yourself up by your bootstraps was that easy. Okay. Does anyone know what a bootstrap is? That's a phrase we use. How many, how many are familiar with that English phrase? Picking yourself up by your bootstraps. Yeah. What do you think it means? Pull yourself out of it. Get over it, you know? Get you out of the grind. Just do it. Yeah. I, I tend to think, you know, I have a pair of cowboy boots and there's two little things on the side of the boot that you can sort of make little loops. I wonder if that's what they are to sort of help me pull the, boots, the boots on. Okay. Um, number five myth. Mentally ill people are dangerous and should be locked up. Okay, we won't even worry about that one. Number six, mental illness doesn't strike children and young people. Gosh. I, I had a friend over the weekend. He told me his son is suffering from same-sex attraction and having to deal with that. And they first learned about it when their son came in as a, a junior high student into their bedroom one day, handed them a letter, and, and in the letter it said, I was thinking of killing myself, but I realized that would really be bad for you and, for you and mom and dad. So I've decided not to do that after all. <laughs> Can you imagine as a parent reading that? <laughs> Gosh. So, so myth number six, uh, it, it strikes children and young people. Number seven, whatever the cause, mental illness is untreatable. Okay, we know that's not true. Okay. And remember the uh, organization we talked about last week, the National Alliance for Mentally Ill, NAMI, N-A-M-I, if you want more insights on mental health, uh, use it, go to that website. NAMI, NAMI. All right, everyone, shake off the, the sleepiness, okay? <laughs> we won't make you do jump jacks. Thank you. Did, did I thank you enough for being a good sport last time? Yeah. Thank you. I, <laughs> what? He said he wanted to get the He will. He will. Um, I uh, wish we had a little lie detector on you right now. Okay. All right. You got ready? Okay. All right. Uh, you saw we didn't have... Um, um, we didn't have an assignment due today. It was due on Thursday, okay? So. Friday. No, that was last Friday's. You said was, so it is due Thursday. I think I, I was talking about the last Friday. Did the assignment say it was again due this Friday? No, that was the Great Exchange idea. The Great Exchange Friday. assignment. Last Friday. Okay, last Friday. Okay, all right. I'm giving you advance notice. Uh, you're going to have a quiz on Thursday on chapters 8 and 10, okay? So you'll need to have studied chapters 8 and 10 for Thursday class, right? So if you don't have a book, hurry and borrow one tonight, study 8 and 10 and take your notes on it, and then give it back to the other person so they can have it. Allie? Stuff notes. I haven't decided yet. No. What? Or you're expressing an opinion? I can't hear you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, while you're doing the assignment for this Thursday, you know, the, the 
the homework assignment, I want you to think about how we could make that assignment better. You know, I don't really love giving, you know, those kind of assignments. So when you're doing this, you know, on the internet site, does everyone know what the assignment I'm talking about? I, I gave you a website of a company that's doing some interesting things in the social world, and I wanted you to explore the website. So how can I know whether you've done that? So I, I, I went through and found 20 things on the website that you had to find out what they were, you know, fill in the blank, et cetera. Um, if you have any suggestions for how, as a teacher, I could know whether you actually went to the website and learned something, or, or how you could go, could go to that website and learn something more than just you know, hunting for words, et cetera, let me know. You know, I want to make the assignments meaningful so they change your life, not just, you know, something you do and you forget the next day. Okay. But I thought this was a pretty cool Columbia. How many of you already tried the assignment a bit? Okay. Did, do you think it was a pretty cool company? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think they have some good messages, some of the good uh, slogans they have. Um, they're doing some interesting things. Uh, it would be interesting, um, uh, Ryan, I couldn't remember. Were they a public company? Did they have public financials? I don't actually think that they were public, but they still they still show the financials. And they're, I mean, they're pretty transparent with what they're doing. Did, so the, I didn't see. Were they making much money? Uh, I, I don't remember. They, they just posted, like, percentage <coughs> profit, but I didn't see what the dollar amounts were. I have to go back and relook it. But. Okay. Yeah, if you find if you find that out, uh, someone email it to me. I'd like to see what they're how they're doing on that. All right, um, I'd like to spend a little more time this morning exploring some of the characteristics of social entrepreneurs, as contained in in a couple of chapters of our book here. Um, uh, an overall general comment about Ashoka. Have you started to? You know, remember that's one of the main cool social entrepreneur companies or, or organizations in the world. Remember who who started Ashoka? Bill Drayton, right? Like Dayton, Ohio, but it, there's an R in there. Bill Drayton, and he started at about what time? When did when did he start working on it? Like 1978, yeah. So that's when he first started working. It started to take off in the 80s when he devoted more time to it. Who was Ashoka? Who, who wants to, instead of mumbling, who can actually take a stab at it? Michael? How did he unify the Indian country? How? He was, I think, his son. He was Hindu. No, sorry. He was a Hindu and he was Muslim. And so he He united it by bloodshed. Warfare is how he got control of all of India. And then he felt remorseful for that and, and denounced bloodshed as a political tool. And this was all about what time frame was this? Where? Third century BC, about 212 to 260 BC. So a couple centuries before Jesus was born. All right. And so he did those great things. And, and Bill Drayton, that was a guy he admired, so he named his organization Ashoka after this Indian ruler. I said, what? Is he the one that starved himself to death like later? Hmm. No. I don't think so. Uh, Gandhi was one that used uh, fasting. Yeah, no, I know there's just like an ancient ruler who did something like that and then converted to Buddhism and then Huh, I don't know. Okay. Or was it? Uh, did, 
Does anyone know much about uh, Hinduism? I, I sat on the plane coming back uh, from Salt Lake to LA yesterday. The fellow next to me was uh, from India, although he now is an American citizen. And he was lamenting that he was missing out on their equivalent of Christmas. Their big Christmas-like holiday was going on right now, and he was on a business trip and away from his family, and it was, gonna, it was like a six to eight day festival. And uh, he pulled out some pictures on his iPhone of their, the lights over their altar in their, temp, uh, in their, in their home where they are, they're worshiping and celebrating. So uh, I wished him happy holidays when I got off the plane. So that, that was interesting. I didn't know anything about that, that their, their big festival was right now in November. So there is a lot we don't know about other cultures. You know, we're so isolated in our little cultures. Uh, I think that's one of the beauties here of BYU Hawaii. And I would hope that you go out of your way to meet people from other cultures that are here and learn about their cultures. You know, this is a great opportunity you have here that you won't probably get when you go back to your homes and you'll be more isolated and homogenous with just the people you, that are like you. So take advantage of this right now. Um, you remember one thing uh, Bill Drayton did when he came up with his Ashoka idea? He said, to market test the idea, they focused on three countries of different sizes with dissimilar cultures, India, Indonesia, and Venezuela. So they went out and did some test marketing in those three countries to see whether the idea was transferable. Okay. That's one of the, the things that he, he wanted to do was make sure the entrepreneurs that they supported had ideas that transcended their cultures. Did anyone feel, uh, have you done enough studying about Ashoka to have any opinions on it? Uh, I, it's a, you know, a very interesting organization, but one thing that made me feel a little funny was they are looking for the creme de la creme, you know, the very elite, perfect entrepreneurs. And it sort of made me feel like, well, they're up there. That doesn't apply to like our class. You know, we're not probably going to be those type of world class, one in a million entrepreneurs. So the bar they set for aiding those entrepreneurs was so high that it, you know, it was almost disheartening. You know, <laughs> I'm never going to be like these guys they highlight. You know, so it, it sort of was demotivating. So that, that, that was sort of one knock I had on, on Ashoka as I was reading it. All right. Um, page 37. Okay. Um, here's an example of why um, it's just... You know, we, we talked about the E and the S in SE, social entrepreneurship. You have some people that are just using business skills to make money, and you have other people that are just trying to help social causes. And in this course, we're trying to bring those two together. And here's an interesting example. This was from the uh, fellow about lighting in Brazil, electricity in rural Brazil. Um, he said, if an investment in solar energy will pay itself off in five to seven years, that means it will be possible to attract outside investment capital. And he said, that is very important because it is not possible to imagine bringing electricity to poor people around the world with only philanthropic dollars. So I thought that was a really interesting idea that if you can make it attractive to business people that will bring their dollars to do it and they will make a profit in, in helping the social cause, that will have much greater impact than if you are just trying to do it by donations, by philanthropic, philanthropic dollars. Do you, do you see the difference there? If you can get Citibank and 
other big financial institutions thinking, wow, you know, electricity is something we can make money on. <laughs> You'll have a tidal wave of, a wave of money coming into the endeavor versus just trying to do it onesie twosie, small scale, trying to get donations from various people and foundations to help your cause. You see that? I think that, that really is a, a tipping point in helping a particular social cause is if you can get banks and investors that want to make profits in there to do it, it will really mean that you're going to have a lot more help. Well, that's what he said here. If, if you can, if the cost of getting electricity to the rural areas of Brazil is such that someone can go buy the equipment and get a loan and pay back the loan in five to seven years off of the cost savings of the electricity, then they will be able to go get a normal business loan and someone will finance that versus just you know, giving it to them, you know, philanthropically. Uh, I was going to say, there's, there's a lot of things out there that are for profit, but to do, do society good. You know, I mean, look at microloans, for example. That helps stimulate the economy in, in, in poor areas, and, but yet it also is an investment, too, you know? Uh -huh. Can you think of any other examples of that? I mean, where, where is big business involved in helping social causes? Where, where are they making money on social causes right now? Medicine? Yeah, there's a little bit of that. There's the government gives orphan drug tax credits to pharmaceutical companies to encourage them to go after small niche markets that they probably wouldn't spend research dollars finding a drug because it, there's not a big enough market. So the government gives them some outside incentives. So there are a few social causes right now in the medical field that might already be a big enough market that they would want to do it on their own for profit, but I, I can't think of many. Here's an ad in a, a magazine I, I caught. This is from a big bank. Uh, you, Anthony, you said you have a, a, a credit card with them. W where's it from? Do you know where HSBC is? I think it's, uh, is it Denmark? Okay, so they have this, you know, this was a four-page spread in the New Yorker, you know, right off of the cover. You, had, you know, you had the cover and you unfolded this, so you know it was a very expensive ad to buy. And you see it says, discover the world's potential with a bank that knows how to find it. And so they're highlighting their social endeavors and saying, look at the good we're doing. So they have one here, it says two-thirds of the people who I've ever reached 65 are alive today. Pakistan is the world's second largest exporter of clothing. 1.6 billion in hid is hidden down the back of US sofas. Well, people are hiding money at home. That's just sort of an interesting tidbit they're bringing out. Five times more people are learning English in China than there are people in England. Turkey has three times as many acres of vineyards as South Africa. The halal, H-A-L-A-L -A -L industry is worth three trillion worldwide. I don't know what that is. Does anyone know what the halal industry is? Yeah, what? Yeah, it's like, it's like kosher. Okay. So that's why they have a picture of someone feeding a baby. Uh, the amount of gold beneath the ocean could give everyone on Earth 100,000 euros. So there's a lot of gold that if we could get at it on the ocean floor, it would help people. 
And here's an interesting one right at the end here. 3%, oh, excuse me, 0. So if we could harvest solar energy in the Sahara Desert, even a fraction of what approach, I thought they're trying to show that they are concerned about social issues. Yes? I was actually wondering the other day if there's any way to harness the energy from the waves that come up onto the beach and hit the beach to harness the energy to produce electricity. So you were just wondering? Did you check it out? Well, I'm just a born idea. Okay. Does anyone know off the top of their head the answer? Max? They do have they do have wavel tide generators. The problem with them is, I mean, obviously, if the tide's going in and out, the waves aren't consistent, so you get a very inconsistent power flow. They also require a very, very high degree of maintenance, and so they're not cost effective in any way, shape, or form. And they also, and the only, there's one that's the, the, one of the few successful ones in the world was also the subject of heavy ironic debate. Why? Because it's built, it was in, it's in Britain, and it's built in this channel where they get like 40 knot currents going through there. And these environmental groups pestered the British government to build a ecological friendly power plant to take care of, like, use that water to, you know, with turbines to make power. And so they spent, I think, several billion dollars building this thing, and they almost lost a couple lives because it was, like, this really treacherous area. And they finally built it, and the day it went operational, the same environmental group that had been asking the product protested them to tear it down because it's a danger to local wildlife and fish. And so now the very same group that had them for years pestering them to put up is now pestering them to tear it apart, and they're just angry. So the British government is just angry about it. But it, they said that they, it, was, it was designed primarily as an experiment. They said it's just so high maintenance that with mastering their power right now is really still quite a bit beyond us in most cases. Yeah. Hulu does a, has air conditioning from the ocean. They have like tubes going all the way down like, the bottom of the ocean, and then they use this power to really cool a lot of stuff. Hmm. Uh -huh. So the heat transfer from the, the water temperature. You can imagine the corrosiveness, you know, just in your homes around here, how the metal gets eaten away by the, the salt water in the air here and how it starts to corrode and oxidize pretty quickly. You can imagine any kind of machinery out in the tidal waves constantly in the water would get eaten up extremely quickly, and that's why the maintenance is so high on it. Yeah. But it is, you know, you think about it, wow, couldn't we harness that unrelenting tidal power? Yes? I, uh, on the subject of alternative energy, I think the best prospect right now is what Japan is doing with their orbital, uh, orbital solar arrays. They are, the first one goes operational in a couple of years, they're gonna have three by 2020, I think, but they've got these massive solar satellite dish arrays up in orbit. They're just huge arrays of solar panels because the solar energy there is the energy there is diffused by the atmosphere and they're beaming it down to microwave dishes on the Japan surface hmm. to generate electricity. Interesting to get it beaming down from the atmosphere. The yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. And next idea from the book. Um, uh, he, he, uh, this is Drayton on page 50 talking about uh, Ashoka, and Ashoka was a global-minded leader, uh, although himself a Buddhist, so he was a Buddhist, it said. Ashoka tolerated other religious sects and guaranteed freedom of religion throughout his empire. He was a practical creator on, a grand, on as giant a scale as anyone in history, comments Drayton. He realized the economy, the economic power of the continental scale empire, and he used that power for social purposes. So the idea of getting some economies of scale, does anyone want to explain what that is in a business context? Let's, uh, let's take Ryan's taco trucks, okay? If he's ordering meat for the tacos, you know, the, the delivery person comes out from the, the meat warehouse and delivers, you know, a package of meat for his one taco truck. 
if he has five taco trucks in the general vicinity, he can have that one vendor bring five times as much taco meat to his warehouse in the same trip. So economies of scale in that regard, instead of making five you know, separate deliveries of, of meat, you can, if you have five trucks, you can have it all come on the one same delivery. So the guy is coming to make one delivery, he might as well bring more at the same time. So that's a crude example of economies of scale. Can you think of any other economies of scale that you've run across in your business lives? There's tons of them, guys. Come on. One is the iPod. It used to be originally really expensive because they didn't have a, they didn't know the market uh, for it, and um, so they didn't produce as many. And then the next generation, they produced, produced more. The next generation, more and more. And so the prices actually went down over time, comparative to the price of the original iPod all the way up till now. Um, it's a lot cheaper because they've mass produced a lot more and it's kind of become uh, cheaper for them and more beneficial. All right. So if you'll give me a bigger purchase order to buy more of the product from me, I can lower the price per product. Do you know that's what we're doing here at BYU Hawaii? Yep. Is the initiative here, we're trying to go, President Wheelwright says we can go up to you know, 5,000 students hopefully in the next about 10 years from now. We're currently at 2,700. And don't quote me on these figures, but if I remember rough memory from the presentation he made, right now the cost per credit hour is about, oh, I wanna say, let's say $90 to deliver one credit hour per student. And if we go to 5,000, he thinks they can get it down to about $62 per credit hour per student. So we can get some economies of scale by going to more students around campus. We can lower the per cost per hour per student of delivering the education here. And think about why that will happen. If you have 2,700 students, do you, do you need a financial aid office? Right? When you go to 5,000, you already have your a financial aid office. You just need to add maybe one or two more employees, but you don't have to add a whole other office with all that infrastructure. So when you increase and you have more people involved, more production, you don't have to have a, 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 a similar ratio of cost increasing. So like if you're at a business and you have a human resource department, you know, someone that handles all the insurance benefits for your company, if you add 100 employees, you know, do you have to add you know, two more insurance people? No, you maybe you only have to add one more. Or maybe no more. Maybe that person can handle all of it. So that's what the idea is. Economies of scale is if you like double your output, you don't have to double your expenses. That's the idea. Okay. Okay. Yeah, they absolutely have to do that. that that's probably going to be the bottleneck. Everyone familiar with the term bottleneck? Yes. Okay. You know, the narrow neck on the bottle that restricts how fast the liquid can flow out of the bottle. And you see that in all your business endeavors. Is you say, what's the constraining factor? What will keep this from going massively? Well, there's probably some hurdle, some obstacle that you need to overcome. Okay. And in a similar vein, uh, someone was talking about Drayton, uh, and he said, Drayton taught me to look for the non-obvious ways 
to gain leverage times 10 on an issue. Leverage times 10. So this guy was really impressed that Drayton knew how to get not just a small amount of leverage, but he said leverage times 10. Can someone define leverage? What's, what's the root word of it again? All right, Charles talked about a, a financial debt uh, definition. How about, how about uh, in general? What, what's the root of the word? Lever. Lever. And from your simple science classes, what's a lever? The triangle with the seesaw on it? No. no. Close. I mean, a, a, a seesaw is a form of a lever. But you have the rock there. And to move the rock, you put the, the long bar underneath it. And if you press down at that end, you can get a multiplication of your force down to this end. So if you put you know, 50 pounds of pressure at this end, it'll give you, you know, 50 times three or four pressure pushing that way on the rock. Okay? And it'll depend on how long the lever is. So when he says 10 times, he has a really long lever where he puts down this amount of effort and he gets 10 times the output on the other end. So leverage is using a tool to get some compounding of the effort. So in, in financial terms, leverage is, you know, like a mortgage is a form of leverage. I have $10,000 to buy a house with. That's not going to get me much of a house. So I go out and leverage that $10,000. And someone says, all right, if you put up $10,000, we'll give you a $100,000 mortgage to go along with your $10,000. So that would be a, a 10 to 1 leverage of my down payment. So that's a form of financial leverage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if what we're, we're doing this weekend uh, with the church is that they're doing some worldwide leadership training. So the, instead of having the general authorities come out to every stake and give this training, they're leveraging satellites to be able to distribute the training to everyone around the world at once. So that's a form of, of leveraging their time and their travel by using satellites to deliver the training instead of doing it all in person. So you can see, do you see a, uh, excuse me, do you see any connection between economies of scale and leverage? Do you see that there may be a little bit of relationship there? All right, uh, next point from the book, page 61. I'm in start of chapter 6. Uh, they went, to remember that one of the countries they went to do some of their initial work in was Indonesia to try Ashoka to see how to do it. Uh, so they would get people to nominate great potential social entrepreneurs that were going to do great things. And they said in Indonesia, he made special efforts to assemble what he hoped would be more com a compatible selection committee, but he ran into a problem. He discovered that in the Indonesian cultural, uh, that the Indonesian cultural sensitivities made it difficult to say no to anyone. Ashoka had to find some way to turn down potential candidates without its nominators and staff losing face. So a lot of you are going to run into cultural issues with your business endeavors around the world, and you need to be sensitive to those. So here it was in Indonesia, if you get them all excited about becoming an Ashoka fellow, and then you have to turn them down, 
that really is going to cause some relationship problems, and they needed to face that and make that not be a, a huge issue. So be aware of the cultural sensitivities in your social entrepreneurship endeavors. All right. Then over the page, on page 63, uh, here's a good example of, remember what's the old principle when you start an endeavor? It's going to take a lot more time and a lot more money than you ever thought. Your estimates, you'll be way too optimistic on how quickly you can get it done and how cheap your budget will be and you'll have cost overruns, and it'll take more money than you ever thought. So when Drayton was starting, uh, he found out that it was the same way in his um, getting Ashoka off the ground. Uh, and uh, that took a, a long time to get things going. Uh, it said here, for the first five years, of Ashoka, I could not get one public foundation in the United States to support us with one cent. None. He couldn't get anybody to give him one penny in five years. <laughs> so here now in hindsight we have a great organization that's doing great things around the world and we all say, oh yeah, I wish I'd been there to help him. And yet very talented humanitarian oriented foundations around the world for five years didn't give him the time of day. So there, you'll have some slow going uh, more than you thought. So don't, don't give up. If you have a good idea, keep at it. Um, I read about the Monopoly board game do they have a Monopoly board game in some of the countries where you're from? Like they have, they have Monopoly in the Philippines? No. Okay. They have Monopoly in uh, Ecuador? Uh -huh. what, what do they call it? Monopoly. Okay. So they, do, do any of the countries they change the name? All right. How about Monopoly in, in, in Taiwan? Yeah. Okay. All right. It was originated during the Great Depression. And the inventor, a guy named Charles Darrow, D-A-R-R-O-O, -O, he could not get anyone to publish it and to, to make the game. He took it to Parker Brothers. They turned the game down, citing 52 design errors in the game. They gave him 52 reasons why it had some, some problems. So he produced his own copies of the game and it sold really well, and Parker Brothers came back to him and said, all right, all right now we'll do it. Uh, in 1935, the New York Times was reporting that leading all other board games is the season's craze, Monopoly, the game of real estate. So it started to take off in, in 1935. So a game we see as the epitome of a successful board game wasn't that way right out of the chute. It, it took some time. All right. um, turn to page 66 if you're following your books. Um, now here, here's one that struck me. They're interviewing a potential candidate to get their help. You know, remember what Ashoka does is they are going around the world and they have networks of people that nominate and, and discover and find people that have stupendous potential social entrepreneurship skills and they have an idea that they are just passionate about. And they want to find them at a time in their development when they can really have an impact and help that person. You know, at, you know it, do we need to go and help uh, uh, Mohandras Yunus now? Does he need any outside help? No, he, he has the Nobel Prize, he's world renowned. If he wants to run with an idea, there's people all over the world that are giving millions of dollars to, to go with the idea. 
So he's not the kind of person that needs help. But one of you that has an idea that needs what is called, have you heard of an angel investor? An angel investor is someone that comes in at a, barely, a very early stage in the development of your enterprise and gives you miraculous help. That's why it sort of gets the term angel. The angel comes and gives you a miracle with some early capital seed money to get your business going. <clears throat> so Ashoka is there trying to find the superheroes of the next 20 years of social entrepreneurship and give them some help now when they need it to jumpstart their enterprise versus already going to the established superheroes and give them more money that really isn't marginally very helpful. Okay. So that's their purpose of Ashoka is to find those. Uh, and here was one. He said, we had a five-hour interview with a stonemason from a village in the south of Brazil. He had developed this novel way to convert low-class housing into a reasonable neighborhood. So somebody that's really doing something in housing to make low-cost housing respectable. In the end, he wasn't selected. And that surprised me. Wow, a guy that has a way to really help you know, housing wasn't selected by Ashoka. And do you want to know the reason? He wasn't selected. He wasn't really a social entrepreneur. I thought, wow, that's a pretty high, high bar. They're saying this guy that has a novel way of improving housing, oh, no, no, he's not a social entrepreneur. You know, that, that sort of struck me. And here's why they said, he didn't have the awareness of the potential of his own idea. What? Did they just steal it from him? <laughs> like, you don't know what your idea is. Yeah. You can't do this. Okay. You, you can see how that would probably happen. Yeah. And you, I sort of think, God, I'd like to research this guy and find out what he was doing. And if he isn't going to do it, you know, we should. Mm -hmm. um, one of Drayton's tests of trying to find out if people were going to be good social entrepreneurs. And, and remember, this is one of the knocks I said on, that I have on Ashoka, is they're trying to find the superstars. And so some of these things don't apply. I mean, that, that stonemason in Brazil, he's, they didn't think he was going to be a superstar, but I still think he was a social entrepreneur you know, at, a, at a, a lower level. But he said one of Drayton's tests was to ask a how-to question in very specific practical terms in order to see if the person would respond in similarly practical terms or go off on a tangent or give a theoretical answer. So he is looking for very hands-on, how-to oriented people. So he would ask them questions and if they started giving him general rhetoric, you know, blah, 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 you know, generalities, he knew it wasn't the right person. But he wanted the people that would come back, and as he said in another place, he said he wanted someone that would immediately have 10 or 15 ideas about something. If you ask them a question about this, they would be thinking this and this and this and this, and it just, you could see, you know, their mind was just racing, and they just were really involved in how to get it done and not just saying, oh, it's a good thing to help the homeless. I'm going to help homeless people. I'm going to help them have a better life. I mean, you see how those words are sort of empty? <laughs> you know? But if someone says, yeah, I have found this interesting material that I can make walls out of, and it's a third of the price of a normal wall building material, and if we can get this manufactured, we can make houses at half the cost of what we're doing right now. And we need this one special ingredient, and I know a place where we can get that, and, and I think if we order enough, we can lower the price significantly. You know, you can see how they're thinking. They're, they're, all these ideas are coming together in, in quite a bit of detail. Uh, 
All right. Let me stop there, and I have one last story for you. It's one of my favorites. Um, remember, um, remember what's, what, what's going to happen on Thursday? Quiz. Quiz on chapters 8 and 10. So that's the role of the social entrepreneur and the chapter, are they possessed, really possessed by an idea? And chapter 10 is probably where more of the questions will be out of. There were lots of good material in chapter 10. All right. Let me share another story with you about $5, OK? Remember, we heard a Joseph Smith story where he, he took out $5 and said, how sorry do you feel for the person whose house burned down? There was um, a man named uh, Solomon Hancock. And he lived outside of Nauvoo, Illinois in the early 1840s. And his wife was Phoebe. And they were going to have their first child. Phoebe was pregnant. And they lived on a farm outside of Nauvoo. And they made you know, butter and, and raised some vegetables and you know, grew some things on their crop or, or from their farm that they would take into Nauvoo to uh, get things that they didn't make, you know, stuff from the general store. So they were you know, excited about the coming birth of their, of their new child. And they made a list of things that they were going to uh, take in to trade for uh, stuff they needed. And they also had saved up and they had a $5 gold piece. And they were going to buy some things for the baby with the money that they couldn't barter for. So they go into Nauvoo and they're you know, on a wagon with a horse. and. As they're going into Nauvoo, Solomon says, Phoebe, I feel prompted we shouldn't spend the money. I, I, we, shouldn't, we should just take our butter and our crops and trade for the very essential things we need. But I, I'm having a prompting from the, the Spirit not to spend the $5. And they talked about that back and forth a bit. And, you know, obviously the pregnant wife was a little bit miffed that suddenly their plans were changing and the things she needed for the baby they weren't going to be able to get now. So you can imagine how, you know, she maybe wasn't too happy with the husband. <laughs> and so they get to Nauvoo and they follow that plan and they keep the money and they just get the bare essentials and they're coming back and it says, this is from Solomon's journal this uh, comes from. And Phoebe is sitting on the buckboard of the wagon with her back to her husband a little bit, you know, showing her, her, you know, uh, frustration at his changing their plans. And, you know, it was things they needed for the baby. You know, they weren't spending foolishly. She thought they needed to get these things for the baby. But he said no. So as they're going back home out of Nauvoo, they get to an intersection and they see some riders coming from the other other road that's coming to the intersection. And so they arrive at about the same time and they see it. one of the people is Joseph Smith on horseback. And Joseph calls out to them, Solomon, do you have five dollars? And he does. And, and Joseph Smith says to the other man with him, said, see I told you we would have money for our food today. And so they got the five dollars from Solomon, and Joseph and the riders went on their way. A few days later, Solomon and Phoebe heard about the martyrdom of Joseph at Carthage. And obviously they were greatly saddened at the loss of the prophet's life, but can you imagine their joy at knowing they had done one of the last kindnesses to Joseph before he died, and how they were so glad that they listened to the Spirit and didn't spend the $5. So I hope that in your social endeavors, when you are prompted to do good things for other people, you will listen and you will follow the Spirit and do it and not let it evaporate. And 
I, I know from my experience, the experience of Joseph Smith, when you do follow those promptings, it can bring you great joy that you don't get. You know, it, it's a much greater joy, deeper joy than spending the money. Think of their whole life, they were able to think of how that helped Joseph with $5. Do you have this story? You could eat? I do. I do. It's, uh, it was actually in the Ensign in about 1975. I'll, I'll find the exact. Can you uh, tell me the link? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. I hope you do some good things this week. See you Thursday.